<laughs> okay, welcome once more to Congregational Cares, Pil Pilgrim's Progress Through the Pandemic, From Coping to Adapting to Transforming. Today's guest speaker is Dr. James Hudna Boimler, Professor of American Religious History and former Dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School. Jim's going to lead us through the 1918-22 flu pandemic, polio in the 50s, AIDS, HIV in the 80s, holding up religious responses and coping skills during those health crises, and helping us see our own current situation in the light of these prior plagues. Uh, and if you've received the Westminster Connection email yesterday, you'll find the links to Kate Payne's and Dr. Dennison's sessions. Heidi's will be up next week. So if you've missed any of the session, you can uh, link into the video. Um, and I'll start us with prayer. Like the psalmist's creator God, we beg you, hear our cry. Have you rejected us? From the ends of the earth, we are calling to you as our world cracks beneath the weight of this COVID curse, and we bury well over a million lost. Why do you cause us to suffer? You promised sanctuary, shelter under your wings, yet we experienced only your rejection. Mother God, we are suffering. Friends and family and grave illness are denied our presence and support. We have missed baptisms and graduations, weddings and funerals. We've prayed for a new heaven and new earth, but not this, not this new normal. Please, please, we beg you, return us to our old normal. Yet, great teacher, you show us the world clearly that our illness is part of a greater global suffering, an unintelligible loss of brothers and sisters. For many, a world of inequalities and denial of access to basic needs and healthcare. Rabbi, help us see and understand our suffering and responses in relation to others. And through distant mirrors, allow us to see and hear the cries and the wisdom of those across the century who have confronted plagues and pandemics, uncertainty and disruption. Physician nurturing God, help us as we struggle through COVID fatigue, replace our despair with gratitude and hope in the light of vaccines and treatments. Where there are problems, help us see possibilities. Exchange our confusion with prayer, insight, and action. Help us recognize you in the process of human minds, hands, and hearts. You and the love, dedication, and creativity of our pastors and staff. You present in the knowledge and cooperation among those who create the vaccines. In the fortitude and passion of frontline responders, and those who grow and deliver food, those who teach our children. Build in us courage, patience against fear. And when our hearts are overwhelmed, lead us to the rock that is higher than any of us. For you are our refuge and our help. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I'm going to share a screen. Okay, so... Uh, I'll be kicking off a conversation today about how religious groups and leaders are responding to COVID-19 with a look back at past pandemics in modern American history. Historians like me like to look at situations by asking, when has something like this happened before? And what are the differences between then and now? And what does that tell us? And of course, that stops being just uh, history and begins being a kind of uh, ethics. Uh, how are we to live? Who are we to be? What are we to do? So today we're going to look at three pandemics, as mentioned before, uh, particularly the first phase of the so-called Spanish flu in, uh, influenza epidemic around World War I and its aftermath the 1950s episode of uh, in increased polio epidemics, and then 1980s with the HIV AIDS uh, crisis and epidemic. Uh, 
Here we have a picture at Camp Funston in Kansas. Emergency hospitals, including this one, arose during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which killed in total about 500, about 50 million people globally. It was an avian flu, an H1N1, that unusually hit younger adults ages 20 to 40, plus the usual under fives and over 65 year old people, especially hard. More American soldiers and sailors died from the flu than in combat, or for that matter, service related things like wounds. As my title for this slide suggests, it really should be called the Kansas flu because the first notice of the disease came in March 19, 1918 at Camp Funston, set up at Fort Riley, the largest of the 18 special camps in the United States designed to prepare large numbers of troops for fighting in France. The flu spread and by April, newspapers were taking notice and then it went away during the summer. Like some of us hoped or thought that COVID would. Of course, as we know, the army was on its way to France via England and in the fall, the flu hit Spain bigger and harder than anywhere else initially but it was also causing massive disease in the US, England, and France. So what do we make of people choosing to blame the Spanish for the flu? What about the doctor in the foreground, if you can see him, not wearing his mask while other care providers are wearing theirs? Just because you're medically trained doesn't mean you are accepting the science of the matter. I bet that's Dr. Scott Atlas's grandfather, uh, somebody who's a surgeon and not a uh, internal medicine person. Just a little joke there, but think about that. What makes some people feel immune from a disease that they're even treating? So let's turn now to how religious leaders and organizations and the way they responded to the challenge of influenza here in the United States. In this newspaper from Maysville, Kentucky, we see that communities closed schools, churches, and theaters. Sound familiar? And this is from October 7th, 1918, when the uh, flu came back with a vengeance. Other papers reported stories too. In Boston, Massachusetts, the Monday's front page of the Globe in September 29th called it the quietest Sunday Boston ever saw with cars largely off the city streets and worship services and other public gatherings called off. Boston's largest newspaper then and now observed that there was less for the citizens to do probably than on any Sunday since the old Puritan days. In San Francisco, at an open air service in front of the First Baptist Church, the interim pastor, he's pictured above there, uh, he suggested that the churches themselves are to blame for the influenza pandemic. This man, Reverend John Quincy Adams Henry, preached that Christian churches have been lamentably weak in morale and spiritual health and have not yet risen to the august occasion confronting them. Our churches have become conventional, cowardly, and worldly. Not only the people, but the churches must repent their sins. And when they do, the plagues will cease, so said Reverend Henry. Now, Reverend Henry was a temperance advocate 
and a fundamentalist. He was arguing the point not from a scientific viewpoint, for the fundamentalists were suspicious of German science and German theology alike, as they liked to link them. Instead, they had an older cause and effect relationship in mind. God sends plagues for God's reasons. If you're sick, it's something you did or something you allowed. Let's look at one more place in the middle of the country. Sunday, October 6, 1918 in Cincinnati, Ohio. The reporter at the Inquirer reported, defying the health board order prohibiting all public gatherings, Father William Scholl held morning masses scheduled at St. Joseph's German Catholic Church. When a police lieutenant arrived on the scene, the priest declared he was not interested in the police's order. But police kept any further services from proceeding. And the inquirer reported widespread indignation against Scholl with dignitaries of the Catholic Church, so bishops, monsignors, so forth, joining the protest against the disregard of an order that was used to safeguard the health of the community. So what do we take away from this? Well, some people are above it and some people um, accept that there needs to change, need changes to happen. The picture on your left here is the American Red Cross uh, chapter in Newark, New Jersey, and, and beyond that, the statewide chapter, celebrating the end of World War I in November. You remember uh, November 11, uh, 1918 was the armistice and gatherings like this happen. And I hope you'll notice and can see the faces that the nurses, the very people who were treating influenza at that very time have their masks off, a mass event. Meanwhile, in St. Louis, on the right, we see Samuel Thurman, the rabbi of the first synagogue established west of the Mississippi. He affirmed the closure decision of the chief of the health board uh, very publicly. He said, due to his determined action, St. Louis has been spared the terrible fate of other cities of its size and larger. The price we're paying now is commensurately small compared with the gain and good we shall obtain in the end. Let us be patient. Let us hope and pray for a speedy banishment of the dread monster disease from our midst and a happy return to the healthy and normal life of the community. So here is a whole nother religious approach. Patience, science, calm and delayed gratification. You have to wonder what Rabbi Thurman would say about getting together on Thanksgiving. Well, let's go now uh, just a couple of years later. And coming from a wealthy family, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was privileged to enjoy his summers at the Campo Bello Island family cottage that was purchased by his parents and located in New Brunswick, Canada. And it was at this site that in 1921, FDR manifested the symptoms of what was called in papers, the insidious and deadly enemy, then known as infantile paralysis, because it struck mostly, but not exclusively children. No one is certain of the circumstances leading to his contraction of polio. Many believed he was exposed to the, pirus, to the virus at a Boy Scout camp in New York just prior to his going to Campobello. He may have actually, 
uh, uh, medical historians think, had had Guillain Barre. But no matter, people knew about polio. And with this and other stories, whenever there was a rumor of an outbreak, fearful parents jumped on this association and began warning their children against swimming in pools, lakes, or any area with open water. Pools were vacated. People didn't go to their lake homes. And swimming became seen as a dangerous exercise. Until the 1955 vaccine for polio developed by Dr. Jonas Salk, Polio was one of the most feared diseases of the 20th century. Why is it feared? Well, because it comes out of nowhere and strikes the young and healthy way before their time in ordinary mortality and morbidity. Many recovered from infantile paralysis, but others became so weak they spent months or the rest of their lives in an iron lung which breathed for them using external pressurization, as you see in these iron lungs in a ward in a hospital. This was, of course, the original mechanical ventilator. To this day, no one knows exactly the route of transmission, but researchers are pretty certain that it works by fecal to oral transmission perhaps explaining why children with poor hand-washing skills led the way in infection. So hand-washing skills again. Polio is an enterovirus. It affects the gut and starting the, starts the disease from there in its human host. In 1952, the number of polio cases in the United States peaked at 57,879 cases, resulting in 3,145 deaths. Those who survived this highly infectious disease and, uh, and with a high mortality, though not, I would note, quite as high as COVID, uh, could expect that they would have some form of paralysis, forcing them to use crutches, wheelchairs, or to be put into an iron lung. And ultimately, poliomyelitis was conquered in 1955, or began to be conquered. We still have uh, polio in some countries of the world today. But it was began to be conquered and in a very serious way in the United States by a vaccine developed by Jonas Salk and his team at the University of Pittsburgh. So let's go to Pittsburgh. Here we see a nurse preparing children for a polio vaccine shot as part of a citywide testing of the vaccine on elementary school students in Pittsburgh in 1954. Now note in this picture two things, the interracial character of the school and the fact that a school nurse is vaccinating every child. There are no anti-vaxxer parents breaking this up. People believed in government and science. They had strong faith in both. It worked first in Pittsburgh and then the vaccination program rolled out all over the country. Here we see first and second graders in San Diego lined up to be vaccinated in 1955. I wasn't alive quite in 1955, but I do remember and some of you will remember lining up with children and adults twice uh, outside, in my case, my elementary school once for the improved polio vaccine, and then again for a smallpox shot. The question that sticks with me is why mid-century adults were more science compliant than now. There were very few religious leaders who spoke out against vaccines, 
but they were seen as crackpots, like the people who didn't want Florida fluoridated water. And larger society sort of turned away from, from the fringe. America in the 1950s was religiously at the high point of mainline Catholic and Southern Baptist observance. The percentage of people who belong to one of these mainstream churches uh, was at its all time high. Their ministers, priests and rabbis, in the case of, uh, of uh, Judaism, all went to college and seminary. Even most of the Baptists who were more of a Southern mainline at the time, as opposed to a conservative evangelical fringe. I think there are two other factors that made things different. Fear for children and their health and the amazing levels of confidence in what science had done as in the case of using atomic weapons to win the war with Japan. Those of a certain age remember people saying, if we can make an atom bomb, why can't we and, and fill in the blank. There was a can-do spirit about America. We even thought we would cancer, uh, cure cancer uh, within 10 years at the time. So let's go to the, our last pandemic or epidemic crisis from which we can learn. In 1993, the Reverend Billy Graham. So this is this is uh, twelve to thirteen years after uh, the mysterious uh, AIDS, uh, HIV causing AIDS uh, development happened. So thirteen years later, Reverend Billy Graham asks an audience rhetorically, "Is AIDS a judgment of God?" He then answered his own question. I could not say for sure, but I think so. Graham later apologized for suggesting that the Almighty had unleashed the epidemic to punish homosexuals. Yet the fact that a, an influential and popular pastor echoed the views, however hesitantly, of harder line clerics, think Jerry Falwell, and Pat Robertson reflected the perception of many Christians. So says Anthony Petro in a recent book, After the Wrath of God, AIDS, Sexuality, and American Religion, in which he looks at uh, how the AIDS crisis became a, um, a dividing point and a bullying point, really inside American religion. What began then as a public health issue, Petro writes, became a pan-denominational discussion of morality and sexuality. Even if you uh, weren't anti-gay, uh, you were still talking about sexuality somewhere in your church. Condemnations of promiscuity, support for abstinence, and monogamy, even discussions of gay marriage as a possibility in the more liberal churches and, and synagogues, all of these were directly or indirectly touched by the moral debates launched by AIDS. And here's an irony. Uh, we see the age of those men uh, who are part of ACT UP, a New York City and uh, San Francisco especially, uh, health gay health crisis uh, group who are protesting uh, that the first promising anti-AIDS drug, AZT, is available, but insurance insurers wouldn't cover the high price of treatment. This is very differently, um, different morally from where we are with uh, COVID treatment and testing, and it's different from polio. What I find 
something of an irony that these men are of course part of the first generation of people to get a polio vaccine. They're somebody's uh, beloved son and society is not taking the same um, uh, protective action. Instead, they're being scapegoated. I suggest that the two main points about how leaders of the Christian right approach the AIDS crisis as God's punishment for sexual uh, moral immorality are these. First, this re rhetoric wasn't new. It comes out of a much older theological and, and religious um, range of statement that connects sexual immorality to threats to a community or even a nation. And if you want to read more about that, either of these two books, uh, Anthony Petra's After the Wrath of God, AIDS, Sexuality, and American Religion, and Marie Griffith's Moral Combat, who takes a, a longer period, a whole century of Christians arguing over sex. Are great resources. <coughs> Christian writers during this time and, and before, reinterpreted biblical passages about the destruction of the city of Sodom as de descriptions of sexual sin, namely the sin of sodomy, which later became the sin of homosexual acts in the 20th century. In fact, the Bible um, that we grew up with, the RSV, uh, put the word homosexual into the Bible where it wasn't. It was more indifferent. Conservative Christians in the decades preceding AIDS worried about an epidemic of immorality tied to the sexual revolution of the 1960s. My second point is that conservative that uh, conservative uh, second point is that conservative rhetoric that characterized AIDS as God's wrath was overrepresented in the media and national consciousness. This is a case where not everyone was down on those those young men, uh, but the the squeaky wheel, the religious minority that made enemies and object lessons out of uh, young men with, with AIDS and other people with AIDS got more media attention. Most American Christians, even most evangelicals downplayed or even rejected the idea that AIDS was God's punishment or they layered their interpretation with calls for compassion. And one of the great acts of compassion that some of you may remember is the Quilt Project, where mothers, friends, uh, survivors made quilt squares to remember someone who had died of AIDS. This is the last time that the AIDS quilt ever appeared all together. They're of course at the National Mall and there were so many deaths, so many people represented by the squares that the quilts filled the space. Mainstream and liberal Christians were slow to confront the epidemic. It wasn't until the mid 1980s that we saw mainstream Christian writers calling for attention to the crisis in national magazines like Christian Century for mainline people and, and Christianity Today for the uh, left uh, side of left and mainstream side of evangelicalism. By the end of the decade though, a number of denominations had issued statements calling for care and compassion for people with HIV or AIDS. That's about the same time as this, uh, uh, this giant quilt uh, display appears in, I believe it's 1991. 
they also called for government funding to fight the epidemic and for an end to discrimination against people based on their HIV status and sexuality. Why did it take so long? Well, the mode of transmission and its association with marginalized people was relevant. These are people uh, who aren't like us, or so it seems until you discover your son has HIV. The Catholic Church, meanwhile, was, was part of the whole mix. It was opposed to condom use no matter who was using them right up until the papacy of Francis in the 21st century, when disease prevention and harm reduction was held to be a valid reason morally in its own right. Even among mainline Protestants, the promotion of same-sex marriage could be seen and, and be sold as reducing promiscuity rather than being a good option for everyone, period. So where does that lead us? Uh, I might suggest at least four questions for reflection. First, what are the justice issues concerning who gets a disease? Are we harder on some people because they uh, are part of a population uh, that's, that's marginalized in some way? Do we ignore their diseases? Uh, does the, thinking about COVID, does the disease affect children or the elderly? or LGBT people, or the obese, or African-Americans, Latinx and Native Americans differentially. I suggest if it's uh, like the majority, you get uh, people caring about those justice issues. Uh, and if they're not like the majority, if you can say not me, even in your head, uh, then there's a lag, the moral response. Secondly, I'd ask, what is the culture's overall receptivity to prevention and harm reduction? Do people think, if I get it, uh, I get it, I'll be fine? Or do they think, if I get it, I might kill grandma? Third question, how do religious leaders and do religious leaders and followers respect science? Do ministers say God will protect this church and all he is baptized and redeemed at our Easter service? Or do they communicate that God's people see God in the science and healing in the hands of doctors too? And finally, how willing are religious actors to look at their own culpability when it comes to spread? Are religious leaders and lay leaders determined to do their part like Rab Rabbi Thurman back in 1918? Or are they so worried of falling out of favor that they assert their First Amendment rights against any health concerns? So those are some of the questions I would pose for us in the here and now, but you may have other questions. So I'm going to stop the screen, stop sharing, and we can talk together. Friends, this is the time where we invite you through the chat function or through simply unmuting yourself. We did that very successfully last week to raise your question or make your comment. So uh, whether you key off of Jim's four questions or you have another question or comment to bring, the time is now. Let's open the conversation. <laughs> 
Susan Hassel, you raised a comment in the chat that had to do with uh, your thinking that evangelical Christians perhaps had never really accepted homosexuality as a norm, while some are more compassionate to their suffering. Uh, and that notion of minorities uh, uh, in the population, speak to that, Susan. And Jim, maybe you'd like to pick up on Susan's comment. Well, I think I heard Jim saying that some evangelicals um, I, th I think what he said uh, were not responsible, quote unquote, for getting AIDS. Uh, and from my experience, I don't know any evangelical Christian that wouldn't say homosexuality is a sin. Um, although I do know many conservative evangelical Christians who match that with compassion for the suffering of those who have AIDS or who are homosexual and suffer the consequences of that. Right. Well, I'm sorry. Are you... No, just a comment. That was just a comment. Yeah. So uh, let's think about that uh, again, go from history to ethics uh, together. There's a lot of thinking uh, inside con conservative evangelical circles about personal responsibility. If you're not personally responsible and you get something, uh, it's on you. We can be compassionate, but uh, you you uh, are are living in your own sin. They eat. Same folks might say, uh, "Love the sinner, hate the sin." Right? That's part of part of the mix. Does that, if we're talking about COVID, um, <laughs> does that get the job done, or do you need something other than personal responsibility alone? Do you need being responsible for your neighbors? to uh, help things along. And of course, all of us use different moral reasoning uh, about different people depending and, and problems depending on how proximate it is to ourselves. I don't think polio parents, uh, parents of children with polio uh, were blaming their own children uh, for their lack of personal responsibility. Well, I don't think the question is personal responsibility. In that case, children aren't, aren't um, performing acts that the Bible condemns that homosexuals are. So children are not, are not quote, living in sin as they might say a homosexual may be. Believe me, I am not in agreement with this. No, I'm no, I, expressing I, an opinion. I see your point, Susan, and, and it is a good one. And it has to do with this sort of, uh, I, I overheard Heidi's uh, pro, uh, uh, presentation last week. Uh, are we in a uh, thought of uh, things happen for God's reasons and disobeying God's uh, uh, commands get, get you the wages of sin? Or are we in some other sort of um, thinking about uh, the causes of disease and uh, how you love people with diseases, no, uh, no matter how they were transmitted. But thank you. That's a really good position. Jim, you've got a question from Sheppy Van. Is it possible the attitude towards science might be related to educational level? Uh, <laughs> it, it very much is. Uh, uh, we we see it through a political lens, but the political lens, uh, par partial the political partisanship, partly divides along uh, educational lines. Now that doesn't mean that. Well, when I was a little kid, most people who went to college uh, voted Republican, and now it's switched to the other way. That does not mean that uh, college educated Republicans. Uh, Aren't, aren't a thing, uh, they, st they still are. But the people who went, paid attention to science classes are the people who are less likely to fall for a, um, uh, a pseudoscience approach or, but everybody's subject to a certain amount of wishful thinking about how diseases happen and whether they'll get them. We all tend to think uh, that 
we're smart enough <laughs> to rise above. That's that's a good point. Jeffy, do you have a, a follow up to that or uh, unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, my one question would be all those people in the Bay Area that have decided they don't care to have their children vaccinated. I know my son works in a, a, an independent school in Oakland, California, and they have an issue with parents who are deciding that their children, you know, there's herd immunity, so their children don't need it. Um, and of course, that that word has also come into <laughs> use yeah. recently in the public forum. But um, but I I just wondered. I think that's an interesting concept because it's probably not a religious point of view out there. But it it's interesting that they seem to think they are protected. Sure, it's it's a ideology that, uh, like religion, uh, is a is a form of uh, group reinforced thought and their belief in. Uh, herd immunity so their child doesn't need to get a rubella uh, vaccine could uh, or hard measles vaccine uh, could be deadly for the child in the class that has leukemia and isn't out about it yet. Um, so again, not uh, however smart the uh, moms and some dads are reading the uh, anti-vaxxer uh, blogs, that doesn't necessarily mean it's scientific, even though it's got lots of reasoning offered for why it's the right thing. Thanks. And I think that's a, that's an interesting aspect. We don't defer to scientists uh, or physicians. You know, before we go to see the doctor, we go on M WebMD. And our, <laughs> our daughter, who's a, a physician, and a lot of physicians I know, uh, really hate to see somebody come in uh, with their printout of WebMD. <laughs> So, so this isn't the 50s um, in terms of deference to science. And is that a piece, Jim? Let's just wrap in Susan's <coughs> follow up here and then we'll go to Jackie's question, uh, which is the aren't most of the anti-vaxxers well educated or many of them and even and even liberal uh, who bring this response of anti-vaccination? Yes, uh, and I see that's, that is true, true to a degree. Uh, it's certainly concerned parents who are doing their own, uh, their own thinking rather than uh, taking their children to the doctor Exciting. and deferring and saying, what do you think? Mike uh, Hassel has a point that Elaine Pagels has said she thinks people would rather be guilty than helpless. And I pick up on that. Um, uh, my first co-teaching assignment was with Elaine Pagels more than 30 years ago. And uh, I think uh, that's right. They'd rather think that there is causation in the universe than, than just be uh, hapless victims. Uh, and so how we think about good and evil and whether we bring that on ourselves or whether sometimes there's tragedy. <laughs> That's the other religious category. Sometimes things are just tragic. People who shouldn't die, die, but we don't know what to make of that. And uh, Pagel's thought a lot about that because she's, um, she had her own husband uh, trip on a mountain trail and uh, dropped to his death right after they had adopted a second child. She had a first child who, uh, uh, outgrew his own organs, uh, also adopted a special needs uh, child who was a wonderful uh, kid until Mark uh, died. So she's thought long and deeply about why bad things happen and whether uh, that is a Christian way to, whether the uh, being guilty is a Christian way to think about it or whether there are more profound uh, ways to look at the tragedies that befall us. Jim, let's uh, thank you for that. A deep response to the multiple levels of this question. Uh, Jackie chimes in on the comment uh, that was made in your presentation about where, when the disease, for instance, HIV AIDS uh, pertain to a minority of the population or how COVID is hitting certain groups uh, can, do you see that? Mine just uh, 
partially disappeared. Let me get back to Jackie's comment. Jackie, maybe you'd like to, uh, in talking with several, the expectation is that you wouldn't need as much health care. Um, Jackie, it keeps moving, I think, because you just made another comment. Why don't you speak to it, please? Well, first of all, I, I made the comment specifically about what I have heard many legislators say about exactly. being opposed to Medicaid expansion and feeling that Medicaid expansion would very much help those who, quote, are in the minorities and they, they don't eat right, they, you know, et cetera. So there are always these excuses as to why those people should not need health care. But I, I think there's an element there of a sense of helplessness um, that Mike points to that is part of the dialogue we are not getting to. And so I, I think it is an extremely useful notion to think about why is it that people come to those conclusions where they're making broad generalizations about lots of people? Yeah, and uh, Lisby Hall uh, kind of picks up on that, saying, following on from Jackie's thought, we're, our evangelical leaders so unconcerned about African Americans and other minorities that they're willing to uh, say if those populations get COVID, then that's somehow God's judgment. Uh, I think, you know, particularly early on in the, um, particularly early on in the spring, you saw a certain amount of that. The first thought is uh, God did that to get somebody uh, or to people who have brought this uh, on themselves uh, because it's, it's not like the uh, polio situation. It's not affecting us. And it's, there's a certain also uh, governmental uh, helplessness that sets in if the challenges are big and uh, they're not really your constituents, it gets very difficult to come to terms with uh, health problems. Uh, that is, that's, born, problems. that's borne out with a couple of legislators who recently changed their view about Medicaid expansion when they had a family member who died of uh, not having care and had to go to an emergency room much too late and didn't get care. Right, moral, more, isn't that real in our lives? Moral change happens uh, in how we think about things after it happens to somebody we love. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, uh, in the LGBT community, uh, they talk about the power of one. If, if you know lots, if you think about a whole population as different than you, you don't have all the moral uh, concern for them than if you know just one person who belongs to that group. And of course that works on racial lines, probably works on political lines too. You know, if, if grandma's a uh, different party from you uh, and you really love grandma, you think differently about the party. That's just how, uh, human beings put together their sense of, of the world. Jim, do you see in Clisby's uh, question here, could there be this carryover, and I think you you just sort of spoke to it, that, that uh, the HIV AIDS original sort of sense of, of judgment that it's a minority population impacted to our current thinking about COVID, um, that's coming in in this time. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, I already was talking to what I saw in Clisby's comment, but I would add to that, uh, I think that it's always a question of us and them or we. If, if people think of our children, that's a we kind of way to think about things. If, um, but if we see Native American Navajos uh, having lots of lots of COVID, uh, do we think we have a COVID problem? Mm -hmm. And until until and unless a uh, society thinks about we, uh, 
we haven't been doing that a lot lately, particularly in an election season. Uh, and, and I guess I would say you go to church to learn that Jesus loves all the little children. Uh, you, you turn into uh, your favorite news, uh, television news source to have some they kind of opinions confirmed. And we live in both worlds. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hmm. Thank you very much. Glenn Davidson coming out of the medical anthropology lens that, that you bring, and you bring many lenses, but that's a particular gift and expertise you bring. And as a person of faith, what are you seeing and hearing as you, this touchstone of religious responses for these three major epidemics is shared? Well, first of all, Jim, thank you so much for the kind of overview that you gave because all three of those pandemics or epidemics that you uh, lifted up really have had a profound and continuing effect on our culture. And I'm thinking not just of those who are the surviving polio uh, victims who continue today to wrestle with the consequences of it, but for uh, even the change in beliefs and in structures. What I'd like to challenge you about uh, in connecting with what was presented last week uh, on taking a look at the biblical uh, reporting about involvement with pandemics is that one of the things that seemed to me to stand out was that when people get very frustrated, uncertain, fearful, and fatigued by a pandemic, they start hunting for gods, plural. Hmm. Out of the American experience, and you as a um, historian of religion, what are some of the gods that people went chasing for, particularly within the church, in each of the pandemics that you've lifted up? Let's start with AIDS. Um, you're a, it's a really fearful uh, disease and some, uh, some people began uh, chasing the evermore, the um, nuclear family as the option. If you look at uh, policies uh, designed to uh, create and sustain nuclear families, uh, you see people, you know, did Jesus have a wife and children? I, I don't think so. Um, that's, that's a particular God. Now, family is a good thing. I love uh, that I've uh, been in families, uh, have a family, uh, but it's not the only way to live. Uh, there, there are other gods uh, uh, that almost take part of a, a kind of magic. If I do this, I won't get that. So, so we play with uh, the gods of fate as well as, as the gods of uh, Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, I'd, have, I'd, I'd like to think more about uh, the gods we seek to control our world. And uh, typically, um, there's an old distinction between magic and religion. Magic uh, gives you the means by which to manipulate your fate. Uh, religion is an adherence to forces larger uh, than yourself. And of course they blend, right? But uh, I think there's a fair amount of uh, seeking after uh, ways of fixing our problem. Thank you for that. Can you, can you though, uh, from what you're seeing uh, with an historian's eye, what kind of God chasing do you see going on today? And that's small g, plural, gods. Who yes. Are the, who are the new gods? So there, there's an interesting one that I don't know all of how to think about it, but it is, uh, it's, it's the God of rights. 
right? We, um, as opposed to thinking about uh, the norm of what we can do for our neighbors. Uh, mm. and, and I would point to a, you know, what we did in polio as, as a counterexample to what I'm talking about. Instead, we assert that the highest, noblest purpose of our nation, our God-fearing, God-created uh, uh, nation, uh, is freedom of religion, uh, freedom to bear arms, freedom to say whatever we want, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and if that has becomes to have a distorted role with respect to um, other goods, then it becomes a kind of idol. I think you're right on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've certainly seen it. And that begins to speak to where Ken Handy takes us next. And we've got a number of, and then Mike uh, and Kelly in between questions here, uh, Jim. Uh, from the present of the gods of right, <coughs> of bearing arms, the freedom of speech, freedom of action, rather than love of neighbor, I will wear a mask, the polio vaccine, we all will get vaccinated. Uh, um, you, you asked the question, Ken, and Jim, do you know this? In the past pandemic, such as the two you've spoke, uh, three you've spoken to, the 1918-19 flu, polio, and AIDS, was there a significant different approach between political parties as to how to address the pandemic? Or particularly with those first two, perhaps I would wonder, was there more unanimity? Or was it a political approach that was different? Well, so 1918 through uh, like 22 is a particularly fractious period in American politics, uh, as was as were the 1980s. That is, there were people in power in the presidency, Wilson and Reagan respectively, uh, and people who didn't trust the leadership and didn't come together. Uh, so uh, you all know about how the uh, League of Nations, uh, what could have been a pretty good idea was opposed by Henry Cabot Lodge. Everything that Wilson uh, tried to do this late into his presidency was was opposed. And so you, these times of political division aren't a great um, ground for uh, mutuality to come through. There, there are other times uh, and and you know polio uh, is is an example where particularly under Eisenhower, uh, there's there's a fair amount of comedy happening between the parties. They're legislating normally. They're doing other great stuff like the uh, uh, internet, I'm sorry, the uh, interstate road system. Uh, and, and the two parties together had won a world war. You know, so that made the legislators uh, able to see uh, we, can, we can get elected out of, out of continuing to work together. Now that doesn't say, um, to answer Ken's question, that does not promise much in the way of uh, getting things done uh, via politics. Mask mandates or something like that are, are going to be hard. Mask, uh, masks becoming patriotic because somebody other than a politician uh, tells you it's patriotic might just work, mm -hmm. at least until Fox or MSNBC tells you, you know, it's not, but. Jim Kelly Christie must have read In Pursuit of the Almighty's Dollar, your book on money and American Protestantism, because she was intrigued by your statements that members will not unlearn the church habit and that churches are more resilient than we think. Can you comment further and whether, given COVID-19, do you still feel this way about the church's resilience in our current uh, time of, of crisis? Yeah, I, I wrote a blog uh, post that looked back at the uh, uh, pursuit of the Almighty's dollars uh, learnings and in past depressions and panics. And 
you know, Bill Christie would know. We had a lot of these uh, worldwide and in the United yeah. States, like the Panic of 1873, the Panic of 1893. Depressions and recessions were frequent. Uh, there's a bad side and a good side. The bad side is people continue to pay their pledges uh, through the early part. Uh, they didn't increase them as much when they were having a hard time or beginning to uh, recover personally. Uh, but they didn't leave the churches. So, so it might be that we have uh, a little dip of support in, in various churches. Uh, that doesn't, that may mean bad things for uh, staff salaries uh, over a, like a five year period of recovery. But uh, the edifying thing is that uh, you're all here this morning and the, and the youth still wanted to be confirmed. And there are uh, uh, forms of belonging that people uh, who associate with churches uh, get as a kind of uh, positive joy in their bodies uh, and minds that, that take them over these times, even when we're, when we're separated. So I wrote about, you know, even if the money goes down, uh, uh, people who have the church habit uh, will return. There's been a lot of worry actually in, in uh, you know, divinity schools and uh, church leader blogs about uh, our people getting out of the church habit. In fact, my mother, Heidi's mother, uh, my mother-in-law wrote in response to this blog, she said, I think a lot of people are, are losing the church habit and just being lazy. And I was so surprised to see it uh, from her. She might be right. But the interesting thing to me is she's actually going to two church services throughout the pandemic, one in her uh, Snowbird Church in Arizona and one uh, at her Minnesota church. So these are interesting times uh, from which interesting things will flow. Thank you, Jim. As we move on to Mike here on the Susan Hansel line, I would lift up for us that Kelly Christie, you, your final word in that question was that you found Jim's optimism encouraging. <laughs> And I remind us all as well that Kelly Christie is the chair of this year's <laughs> generosity campaign at church. Thank and you, next, Heidi. And next Sunday, <laughs> November 22nd, is our Generosity Sunday. So Kelly, thanks for bringing that into the conversation because every you. facet of who we are, right, is right. impacted. But both you and Jim have spoken to resilience to optimism, to the joy of our confirmands, to the joy of 60 plus people on this class call today. We are the church friends and we are being the church and God is in our midst. Uh, Mike here, ultimately this boils down to the problem of evil. How a knowing, caring, benevolent God can allow horrible suffering by innocence. Should we acknowledge that maybe God doesn't control viruses? Or uh, to give you my answer, God, could it be that God works uh, in, in uh, uh, much broader ways than we can understand? Uh, that, that uh, you know, predatory animals uh, that, and viruses are all part of uh, a, a good creation uh, that we don't fully understand. And, and sometimes the alls, the omniscient, the um, all caring, all benevolent, uh, all loving, uh, that we attribute to God out of a certain uh, philosophical tradition that we, uh, we learned, maybe in college, uh, maybe in Sunday school, uh, but we learned it from the Middle Ages when their idea was to set a, a very reliable, predictable God way up high in scholastic philosophy. Uh, what, if, what if it turns out the God is more like the God that uh, uh, ancient Israelites and early Christians report in the Bible? Uh, that that we have uh, 
messed ourselves up by misattributing God's uh, God's abilities. I'd say God's abilities more than than God's uh, love. Could it be that uh, part of God's love is, as the Bible says, God keeps coming back. He sends prophets. God sends uh, Jesus. God sends uh, apostles. Uh, God doesn't give up on us, and that's that's a more important thing than whether uh, you know why did God create uh, viruses or worse yet prions. You know, some uh, you can look that up later. Uh, something that apparently has no biological. Uh, beneficial biological use, unlike viruses that, you know, can helpfully communicate things between organisms. Um, putting God as the author for all of that's quite a thing. Mike, is there a follow-up you'd like to that or a question from anyone else? I know we're at time and some people may have fallen, uh, needed to move on to other things, but I've also sensed a whole lot of conversation. So, Please feel free to unmute yourself or tap, uh, type a question in the chat if uh, this is still stirring in your mind and heart. Jim? Surely. I have a question. Um, in the 80s, during the AIDS crisis, uh, there was tremendous anxiety in, the, in professions because people were so extremely sick. Uh, people were working on the front lines. Um, but I don't remember that because I was doing a lot of, of interventions with nurses at the time. I don't remember the moral distress. And right now, there's a lot of, and it's in the literature, it's in, it's in Zoom meetings, it's all over the place in terms of the moral distress of the professions. Uh, not just nursing, but engineering, scientists, you know, right, physicians, right down the, of all professions that are working in the front lines. Could you comment from a theological perspective about the moral distress that is present right now and, and, and how can we, where could we move with that from, from a church perspective? Well, yeah, so, so I, how I hear your question, Shirley, is about sort of particularly the moral distress of caregivers, people working in, in, uh, in hospitals, uh, in, in, you know, in churches uh, back, you know, Glide back in uh, San Francisco. Um, they were, they had deep concern and they were committed to uh, caring, almost speak of the middle ages, you know, they could care when they couldn't cure. Here, the moral distress, I think, has to do with how quickly it's not an epidemic, it's a pandemic. It's everywhere and people aren't doing the things that could keep um, this from happening. And one of the saddest things I, I think I read about this whole thing happened this spring where a, uh, a very talented uh, doctor who had become the, gone from chief resident to a attending emergency physician killed herself, despair. Mm -hmm. When you're caring people despair because they don't think that everybody else gets how bad this is. Nobody cares about what we're doing. They feel isolated, lonely, and, um, uh, and unable to cope with the scope of how many people are sick. And I, I suspect we had that in 1918. We just don't have the kind of... Um, we didn't have the kind of personal culture that shared feelings back then <laughs> in the same ways. We sometimes see it in novels, but not like uh, we saw it in this crisis. And sometimes you gotta wonder uh, if, if our collective action is creating this much um, risk to the people who care for us, whether, whether it's a cold or cancer, uh, is how does that reflect on us as a society who have a special relationship there you know one in, one in a hundred of us uh, uh, care the rest of us get to do other jobs but if we're thoughtless and it 
it puts them at extreme risk for themselves and to care for us. That's a huge moral uh, dilemma. Jim, you've spoken in a very focused, helpful way about uh, moral distress, particularly in, in, in medicine and the caregivers, right, at all levels and all who work in hospitals. Jackie Schrago reminds us about the moral distress among teachers. Can you extend that concern into the frontline workers who are teachers? Yeah, sure. Uh, all of us, uh, we've gone through this whole thing where the children belong in school. Uh, it leads to terrible things if they're on their own uh, as not latchkey children, but uh, you know, they're, in their, they're locked in their own home. They're not socializing normally, et cetera. Teachers feel that, but they don't want to die either, right? And so we, we see communities where nobody wears masks for either uh, political reasons or children don't wear masks for political reasons or misplaced uh, health uh, sense reasons. And, uh, and teachers, 50-year-old uh, you know, teachers find themselves uh, uh, with COVID and in ICUs and, and people lose people. That's, that's a... Uh, Caring for each other always bears risks. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we inflict risks on others because we're part of a social system and we say, you have to do this and you can't wear a mask because they can't, the kids won't be able to see your mouth. Um, you've got to wonder, are we being, um, dare I say, Christian? Uh, to the others who have to uh, step up to do the work. They want to do the work of teaching. They just don't want to die or, or be part of a nexus that uh, takes it home to grandma, so to speak. Since you brought up teaching, I need to uh, thank the church for leaving at my daughter, who is a teacher and working, a lovely little gift and just a thing that made her know that the church supported her and was thinking about her. Um, she called and she was so excited and her daughter got on and she was so excited. It was whoever, you know, engineered that. Thank you very much. Cause it was a lovely thought. And it occurred to me that maybe we could do something for our nurses and our doctors as well. Something simple and small and go ahead. And, you know, I'd be happy to be part of a delivery crew for that. Cause I think it, it meant so much. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I look yeah. around the room and, you know, the great difference between World War II and, and Vietnam was what? People back home cared. Our, we're now the people back home. It, Shepi, thank you, Jim, for, for, you're right. And what were our public actions then, right, of care? Shepi, that was a combination effort between our Christian Education Committee and our Westminster COVID task force, actually a, a trio, the Westminster COVID uh, task force for specific tasks. They stepped up to deliver the packages. The CE committee created them. And our COVID task force for prayer has been praying. And at the start of the pandemic in the spring, the COVID task force for prayer has been praying and uh, cards to all those nurses and doctors and other frontline healthcare people were sent. But as you bring that up, Sheppy, right now, what did we think in the spring? We thought, we thought it'd be over in the summer, right? So because it's lengthening, we need to step it up for our healthcare workers again. You're exactly right. And perhaps something even more physical and tangible like that care package that came to your teacher daughter um, on behalf of the church needs to happen. We're going to need to have different rounds, right? <laughs> because this pandemic keeps lengthening of upholding one another with grace, with comfort, with strength and the love and support of the church. Mike, you have said something about uh, viruses. You agreed that viruses can have some constructive roles. So how do we think about duality and symmetry, that there is no good without evil, light without darkness? We're getting into not only moral and ethical distress, but deep theology and, and theodicy here. Yeah, ab absolutely. There, there, <laughs> there is no life without death uh, in, in a physical, corporeal form as well. 
and part of so yes, uh, dealing with the shadow side of 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 the good is one of the great theological problems. It's not just evil; it's that uh, it's that we live in a much more complex world than we usually go about our world thinking about. Uh, and yeah, it's deeply theological to begin thinking uh, the kinds of thoughts that uh, uh, Mike raises. So is it possible then, as Bill Christie raises, that even amidst the uh, theodicy, amidst tragedy, can there still be positive outcome, like the YouTube video, The Great Realization States, that uh, when we found the cure, I, I'm assuming, Bill, you might need to speak to this. It has to do with something, pre, one of our previous pandemics, and we're allowed to go outside. We preferred the world we found to the world we left behind. Is there a possible silver lining? Because the old normal, the normal we knew we will never return to. We are being pulled forward into a change normal a new normal for the rest of our lives individually and corporately. Did I summarize that correctly, Bill? Yes, um, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend you look at it. Just go onto YouTube, it's called The Great Realization. And it talks about the way the world had worked and, and greed and self-interest and polluting our planet, et cetera. When we're then confined for this long a period of time and you find a cure and you've already, you know, as I said, dusted off your instincts and learned how to smile again and care for one another, that that could be the continuing way this falls rather than going back to the old normal because we've learned new tools to kind of cope with one another and, and our society. Jim, have we seen that in those the previous ones? I, I would suggest we did from the flu pandemic to polio to uh, AIDS. Yes. It led uh, it forward in new ways. Yeah, uh, I mean, it should lead you forward. Uh, sometimes just the relief of uh, it's gone can make it go away. And I want to uh, put together something Bill said uh, about you know, learning new ways and appreciation with something that Jackie Schrago just wrote. Uh, the rest of the world faces this kind of thing more often. You know, uh, Ebola was what, six to 10 people in the United States, but in Liberia and Sierra Leone, it just went on and on and on. Uh, and people didn't give up. In fact, monoclonal antibodies that we've heard of, turned it from a 80% uh, mortality to an 80% uh, uh, survival uh, situation. Some, one hope that I would have is that our collective brush with uh, early death would make us more conscious of other people's constant uh, medical and social frailty in other parts of the world. So Jim, perhaps this is a good question, maybe if I don't see others to, to conclude on. I believe that's likely uh, Suzanne Allen. Uh, you cited some religious uh, leaders, the rabbi in St. Louis um, on the one hand, helping uh, during the flu uh, pandemic. You also cited some other comments from, say, Graham or Falwell later in another crisis. She's asking, have any religious leaders today advocated for masks, et cetera, to help curtail COVID? So I, I, and I would widen that to, uh, if you could reflect, are there any today who are helping us with a faithful religious response? Maybe a, a summary sort of closing could be, how would you challenge us as individual believers and as Westminster Church to be part of a constructive religious response? Sure. I think the most constructive religious response people could be making, and because of the nature of um, the nature of American re public religion at the moment, it's, it's t the, the loudest voices, the people with TV shows, et cetera, the people with megaphones, are not the people we 
need to do this because their inclination is to uh, uh, lead by division, sadly. Um, you know, there is no uh, Theodore Hesburg at uh, Notre Dame. In fact, the J President Jakin said Notre Dame is the guy who got COVID not once but twice, um, doing what the students were told not to do. I think it's really important for uh, ordinary religious leaders to decenter the whole mask debate because the masks are what we have right now to protect ourselves and, and protect others and make it, uh, if not a cool thing to do, uh, the right thing to do, not because you supported Biden or Trump, but because you, the, you support the people right in front of you. It's, it's getting old and it's tedious, but we need sort of a, a patriotic and religious other regarding uh, plea for masks, later vaccines, and um, you know, support for what it takes because uh, there will be enormous personal fortunes. Well, let me put it, a lot of people are at risk of, of losing everything to their hospitalization costs that are not yet fully covered. And, um, you know, we're, we're in a big, we're in a disease and we're in a social crisis. Mm -hmm. So anything, churches are pretty good at helping bend the curve on social crises because they work at the dimension of uh, the moral and the thoughtful. Mm -hmm. So perhaps to use the MLK oft quoted but wonderful metaphor that the arc of justice, right? Uh, I think I'm paraphrasing it right. Bends, the arc of, of the world bends toward justice. Perhaps then our actions, being other regarding, seeing those right in front of us, supporting those at risk on all the front lines, right? That that is part of our own participation as people of faith and helping to bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice. Yeah, the corollary is it doesn't bend by itself. Right. We help bend it. Exactly. We are part of that bending. And that is our Micah 6-8 that we are called back to Glenn Davidson to false, not to, to the false gods, to false idols that we create, but toward loving kindness, working for justice and walking humbly with our God and all that adds up to loving God and loving others. So dear friends, let us go forth into this week. Jim, thank you. May I uh, invite us to give thanks. <laughs> thank you all. God bless you. God be with you as we go into this week. Take care.